And so the first topic that we're going to look at is behind this card here. And we're just going to review the JavaScript language. Now, the layout of uh, what you're seeing here is more typical of the layout uh, for each week as we work our way through this. So there'll be one or two sets of cards that will have the PowerPoint slides behind them. And then you have cards that are linked to lab exercises that you carry out uh, in your own time. So in the case of this one here, I've got one set of slides and, sorry, I've got two sets of slides. Certainly won't get through both of them today. And it looks like I've got two lab exercises. We would also publish the recording of each lecture uh, in behind each of these cards. So you'll see a, a kind of a, a kind of a YouTube icon appearing down here after today's lecture, and you can go back over the, the the recording if you if you wish. So let's uh, let's look at the slides behind this card here. So I'm going to give a very very quick uh, background on the language. I'm going to spend uh, about uh, a minute, let's say, on that. And then the way I've broken up how I'm going to discuss the language is, first of all, talk about how we represent data or state using uh, the JavaScript syntax. And as you may or may not know, if you've covered JavaScript at any stage, it's all about the object construct in JavaScript. So we need to look at uh, that side of the language. And then laterally, we look at how we represent behavior or logic and in the, uh, in that aspect of the language, it's all about functions in the case of JavaScript. JavaScript does have classes, but classes are not native to the language. They were brought in more recently, mainly to satisfy uh, the community's desire to have them because a lot of programs are come from class-based languages like Java and they would they wanted them in the javascript language and so they were brought in but they're not native uh, essentially once you transpile a javascript class it is converted back into functions uh, and that's what's executable uh, as it turns out throughout this module uh, certainly from what i cover we don't use classes at all and if if Frank uses classes, it's fairly minimal. So we're sticking with the original kind of constructs of the language, if you like. Uh, JavaScript is an extremely useful language to have within your toolbox of languages. What I'm showing you here is a screenshot from um, from a report that GitHub produces at the end of each calendar year. And there are various uh, statistics and data in that report. And the report really summarizes the kind of activity that's happening on the GitHub platform. The report itself is, refer is referred to as the Octoverse report, and you can Google it yourself. This is a screenshot from one part of that report where it's showing us the popularity uh, of various languages on that GitHub platform. And it's plotting them over the years, really. And you can see there that JavaScript has been the most commonly used language on the GitHub platform for quite a number of years. So hence, it's uh, it's good for any graduates to have some knowledge of the language. To reinforce the importance of JavaScript, this is a screenshot from a an annual survey that Stack Overflow carries out where they essentially survey the community on various aspects of technology in terms of what they're using. And so on the language front, uh, JavaScript, again, is the most used language uh, of the people that respond to the survey anyway. Uh, GitHub, I suppose, is a bit... GitHub, uh, the previous slide, is not a survey as such. It's just a troll through the various GitHub repos to produce uh, the data that you saw on the previous slide. So either way, uh, seems like it's good skill to have. A lot of uh, text here, which I'm not going to go through, 
the essential point here is that, okay, JavaScript was created by this guy called Bernard Icke, who worked for a company called Netscape, who produced one of the first browsers, as you may know. That was in the early uh, 1990s. And he handed the language over to an organization called the ECMA organization. Uh, ECMA stands for, as I'm saying here, the European Computer Manufacturers Association. They were a standardization body. They now, if you like, kind of manage the evolution of the language. And what they, they are a standards body. And so what they did was they published a specification for the JavaScript language. It is a specification and they call the specification uh, the ECMAScript specification. So anywhere you come across ECMAScript, uh, that is the specification for a programming language. The only implementation of that language is JavaScript. That's technically the relationship between uh, the two, those two uh, um, concepts. Okay, so the ECMAScript, lang the ECMAScript specification then uh, evolved over the years. So there have been various releases. The very first release of the ECMAScript specification seems here was in 1997, which was pretty soon after Bernard Icke handed the language over to the ECMA organization. And there have been various uh, increments to the specification. So the first one is 97, then the next one was 98. Then if you follow through, it almost kind of disappeared because at the time, JavaScript was only executable in the browser. And there was very little JavaScript being written. There was no notion of web apps back in the uh, late 90s now. The web apps, as you saw from one of my earlier slides there, didn't really start to materialize. Client-side rendering web apps didn't materialize until you know, 2003, 2004. So between the late, the late 90s and the early noughties, there was really very little use uh, uh, for the JavaScript language. And, and at one period, it was felt that the language was just going to fade away. But a couple of things revived it. And in particular, what revived it was the emergence of the Node.js platform. This now allowed the developer community to write JavaScript that ran on the server side. And there's no, it's not um, by accident that this, this Node.js platform uh, emerged in 2009. And 2009 here was roughly when the, the ES5 specification was uh, released. And the version before ES4, sorry, ES4, you can see here, it was essentially abandoned because there was too, too lack of interest, I guess. So we always talk about ES5 and ES6 when we're talking about this ECMAScript evolution. ES5, every browser uh, can execute ES5 JavaScript. Um, I often refer to ES5 as vanilla uh, old style JavaScript. ES6 then was another milestone in the ECMAScript history because in ES6, there were a number of new, and you can see there's quite a time gap between ES5 and ES6. ES6 introduced a number of modern programming constructs and concept into the language. For example, ES6 introduced the notion of classes into the language, amongst other things. And I guess, you know, the reason, one of the reasons they brought classes in was to, as I said earlier on, to as in response to the community and also to make the language more uh, acceptable to kind of modern day programmers. And then really from ES6, which we also refer to as ES2015, from 2015 onwards, there has been a new release of the ECMAScript language every single year. So we talk about ES6, ES7, ES8, et cetera, et cetera. And each, each uh, evolution of the specification is adding some new syntax um, based on kind of other languages uh, of their era. So uh, we today we write ES6 plus 
JavaScript. Nobody writes ES5 JavaScript anymore because it's uh, it's really kind of old style. But we still need to ensure that the JavaScript that we write, which is ES6 and beyond, it still has to be converted back into ES5 JavaScript because the browser that 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 the code may need to run in is a browser that only executes ES5. It cannot execute ES6. Admittedly, it's very old browsers, but we still have to honor that. Now, this conversion of uh, ES6 plus JavaScript back to ES5, obviously, it's an automated process. And we refer to that process as transpilation. And the dominant tool, although the, there are alternatives now, but for a number of years, there was only one tool that carried out that transpilation for us, and it's called Babel. Uh, there are more modern ones, though. But we will be using Babel. But it's something that's going to be used in the background. We don't ever need to uh, concern ourselves with it. Every now and again, all right, I will refer back to it uh, as being present in the whole development process. Uh, but uh, so transpilation is this idea of converting modern JavaScript back to uh, pre ES6 uh, style JavaScript. And uh, the other reason we might need to do that is if you are running a very old version of the Node platform, or if there is somebody that is needs to use a very old version of the Node platform, yet we want to run our more modern server-side JavaScript on that old platform, then we transpile it back to ES5, and we can be guaranteed that uh, the old Node uh, version will be able to execute it. OK, uh, that's my background to the language. Uh, uh, so the only real takeaway is this ECMAScript uh, idea and what how that relates to the language and the evolution of the ECMAScript specification. And when people talk about ES5 and ES6, that you have some sense of uh, what they mean. So in terms of the syntax of the language itself, first of all, I'm going to look at how we represent state or data. Not surprisingly, uh, JavaScript has primitives. And the primitives are all of those primitives that we would expect any language to have. So we have numbers, strings, booleans. It has the null type, uh, which is essentially the same as the notion of null in a language like Java. And a peculiarity of JavaScript is it has a type called the undefined type. And the undefined type has one value and only one value. And the value is also called undefined. It's a bit like null in that sense. but uh, So this is the one that catches people out quite a lot. Uh, so undefined is A, it's a type. And it has only one possible value. And its value is the undefined value. That's, that's an actual value. Now, when might a variable uh, be assigned the value undefined, and hence its type is undefined? Well, there are two occasions when it rises. Number one, if you declare a variable and you don't initialize it, then the default value is undefined. That's the uh, what the runtime does. And there is a second occasion when undefined turns up, and I'll talk about that. Uh, when we start talking about objects, because it comes into that discussion. So for now, undefined is the value that is assigned to a variable when you do not initialize it, when you declare it, but don't initialize it. The other characteristic of JavaScript is we say it is a dynamically typed language. What that means is when you declare a variable and you assign a value to it, so let's suppose we assign a, a number to that variable, in the very next line, we can update that variable, but assign a completely different type of value. We could assign a string to it. Hence, the variable doesn't really have a static type associated with it. Its type is determined by 
what its current value is. Hence, we say it's dynamically typed. That has great uh, consequences, great, great advantageous consequences, and it also has some significant disadvantages associated with it. Now, uh, in order to uh, kind of give you illustrations of various aspects of data representation in JavaScript, uh, what, what I uh, what I did was I have a small little uh, project, if you call it, uh, just a bunch of files, really, inside in a folder. Let's call it a project, and we will use that little uh, project to explain various. Uh, issues that I want to cover in this set of slides. Now you'll get the project when you go into the first lab. So if I go over to here, when you go into this lab here, and if I go onto the second page, and if you scroll down, it tells you eventually I think there's a, where do I do it? Can I do it down there? Sorry, no. Oh, here we go. So it's telling you here, if you click on this link here. Sorry, yeah. Uh, if you grab that, download it, it'll, it'll download a, an archive, unzip the archive, and import it into VS Code. So the archive, when you unzip it, is going to be this folder here. And here's our first look at VS Code. I've got VS Code up and running, but it's currently not, it hasn't opened any project, if you like. So this is what you see when you start VS Code for the first time, if you haven't used it before. And now I want to import my folder into VS Code. And what's nice is it's a simple drag and drop. So I'm gonna talk my way through these uh, files here. And so here's my, uh, I'm in the Explorer view, if you like, or activity. And here's my editing area. We can just close off that. That's the initial window. So if I click on any one of these files, you know, I can see the contents of them. Now I don't have any panels open at the moment, but the main panel that you would want to open is a integrated terminal. Now at this stage, I use keyboard shortcuts for all of these things, but the long-handed way is to go up here and go with that. And so now here's my, I'm just going to close off this part here. Here's my, essentially my command line, my integrated terminal. That's my prompt, but you have just a standard prompt. So you can type any of your normal um, shell or DOS commands from here. So for example, if I want to check what version of node do I have, I can go node minus V. That's the version I have. Now, uh, the lab explains it, but there is a an extension that you that I'd like you to install for this particular lab, and we will use it in the second lab as well. And as the it's a, it, it does explain in the lab exercise how you install the extension, but a very quick uh, preview of it is you go to the extent the extensions activity, which is this one here, and you essentially type in the name of the extension that you want to install. And what happens as you're typing is VS Code is communicating with a, it's actually a GitHub repository that contains all of the uh, approved extensions and it shows you matches for what you are currently typing. Now, the extension that I want to install is called Live Server. I already have it installed, uh, but if I start typing the extension, then here are some matches that it has found. And in fact, this is the one here that I want you to install. Because I have it already installed, I don't have the option to install it. But if I didn't have it installed, then there would be an install button here. And you just simply click on it and that's it. Uh, you don't 
for safety sake, you may need to restart VS Code after you install an extension, but in many cases you don't. But just for safety sake, uh, you 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 should, I guess. So the live server, what is this? The live server extension, really all it is, is a standard web server that you can use from within VS Code. And when you have it installed, the way you know that it is, is it has installed properly is, I just need to move this around so that you can see it. If you look down here at the bottom right, you can see this go live link in my status bar. By clicking that, I will start my live server, web server, and it will serve the contents of the folder that you currently have open. Sorry, the contents of this folder here. Now, because it is a web server, it obviously goes looking for HTML files, and the only HTML file I have is this one here. So it's going to serve that page to um, what, what the live server extension does, as well as starting the web server, is it also opens up a browser tab. So maybe if I just click on go live down here, uh, you should also make sure that there aren't any files open initially. I'll click on go live. And it's, this is the page that it's serving me. And if I look at the contents of that HTML page, turn this down a little bit, then yeah, that looks about right. Because really the only contents of the page is that there that I've highlighted, that uh, H1 header, and that's what is being displayed. Now, we really don't care about HTML at this stage. We're talking about JavaScript. So what you need to do is you need to open up what's referred to as the developer tools in Chrome. By the way, it's Chrome that we use throughout this uh, module. Most of what we do will work on other browsers as well, but there can be one or two issues with, or there has been with, for example, Firefox in the past. So for uh, simplicity's sake, I would uh, encourage everybody to use Chrome. And what we need to do is for this particular exercise, and really for a lot of what, what we do throughout this module, it's always a good idea to have your developer tools panel open within your browser uh, so that we can see what's going on behind the behind the scenes, if you like. Now, I have a keyboard shortcut for doing that, but if I wanted to, Sorry, just give me one second now in case you haven't done it before. You know, how to, this is how you open up the developer tools. So you go here and, and so used to doing it by keyboard shortcut now. Developer tools. Oh yeah, there we go. last. Okay, here are my developer tools on the right, and I has a number of tabs, and we'll just open up the console tab. So that means if there's any JavaScript code behind this web page, when that JavaScript code executes, if the code happens to output stuff to the screen, then where it would output to is to the console tab in the Chrome browser. And I'm sure you're already familiar with that. So but just in case, right? That's that's the setup that you have to do, uh, and the, the lab uh, goes through that for you anyway. I'm just going to do a manual refresh now, just to clear that little error that's appearing there in the console. No, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry, that wasn't clever. Let's go back to. Let's go back to here. By the way, if you want to stop the server, uh, the way you do it, once the server starts, the go live link in the status bar changes and it goes to port and it tells you what port number the server is running on. So if you want to stop the server, you click on this hyperlink here. So I'm going to do that. 
and I'm going to start it again because I accidentally closed off my browser tab and opened up my developer tools. Right, I've got a cleaner one this time. Back to my page. And what we're really interested in is these scripts that are included in the page here. And we'll kind of go through them one by one fairly quickly. So we'll enable the first script, which is this one here by uncommenting it. What's nice about the live server server is once you make a change and save it. And so if I now save that change, uh, the changes will be pushed up to the browser tab. So the browser tab uh, has now been refreshed automatically. And if we open up the actual script file that's being referred to by this script tag, so it's the uh, zero one primitive script, which is this one here. And all we've got is some very trivial uh, declarations of some variables that are assigned primitive values. And we've also got a one or two console logs, as you can see. So those console logs will output to my developer tools. So this stuff here on the right is being generated by the console logs in my script. Uh, and so let's just look at the script, even though it's pretty trivial, I admit. But uh, so how do you declare a primitive variable in in uh, in JavaScript? You use the let keyword, the variable name, and you assign it the primitive value. So it looks like foo one is currently anyway. It's a numeric variable. Foo two uh, is going to be a string variable. Uh, foo three is going to be a boolean. Foo four, uh, we are sending it now. Pi is some sort of computation, so it's going to be numeric. So when I do a console.log of foo one, foo two, et cetera, et cetera, then I get, uh, I get, sorry, did I enable the wrong one? Thank you, pardon. Back to here. Sorry, this script here is also enabled, which it shouldn't be. So I'm going to disable that one. Okay, save it. Right, that looks a bit healthier. So this line here uh, was produced by the first console.log that you saw in the script. And if I go back to my script, I have here, all I'm doing is I'm showing you the dynamically typed nature of JavaScript because when I declared foo one, I assigned it a numeric value. Sorry, beg your pardon. I'm, I'm showing you something else here. All I'm showing you here in this line here is obviously when you reassign a variable, you, you drop the keyword let. Uh, so let is only for declaration. Okay, that's fine. Foo two. Foo2 was initialized, you can see on top there, to a string, but now I'm assigning Foo2 a numeric value. And that's really the dynamic uh, lead type nature of JavaScript being illustrated there. It may not be a great idea to have variables whose type changes many times during runtime, uh, could reflect poor design, but the language does allow it. Here, what I want to illustrate is this undefined uh, issue that I was mentioning. So I'm declaring a variable called foo5, but I've not initialized it. So that means when I console.log foo5, what do I get? I get the undefined value being displayed for me. So it's not an error as such. Uh, uh, undefined, but it can lead to errors. And what am I doing here? Uh, why did I 
I do that now? I've forgotten why I'm saying that's an error. It's not an error. Let's go over that. I'm not sure what point I was trying to make uh, in that last line there. Right, I'm going to move on before I say something I shouldn't say. Oh, that's misleading. Okay, so the only purpose of that little example was just to show you the basics of declaring variables, which is involved using this let keyword. Oh, yeah, sorry, I know the point that I was being... Um, yeah, back to here, right? I'm, I'm not using let here to declare this variable called pi. I'm using the keyword const. And const means, it's kind of short for constant. Uh, a constant, you would use the keyword const before a variable declaration if you, essentially what you're saying is that that variable cannot be reassigned a different value subsequently. Hence, it's a constant. A let variable can be reassigned a different value. And so if I enable this line here, I was a bit slow now coming back to that, but uh, this now, by enabling this line, I'm violating the declaration that I made about pi up here. And so when I save it, and go back to my browser. Uh, I'm getting the error there. And the error is essentially kind of warning me that you, you've you tried to reassign a different value to a variable that you've declared as a const. Now, you could be lazy, and often I am, in that you could just declare every variable with let, even though some of them should properly be declared with const. So const, uh, you should use it as often as you can because it's not so much for your own sake, but for the sake of other people that are reading your code. When they see that a variable is declared with const, then that is telling them the intent of that variable, as in it is not going to be reassigned. And a lot of when we write code, uh, or what we should think of is, about people, other people that are reading our code to make it easier on them. So let and const are alternatives that we can use and we should use them properly. Uh, a lot of text here again, which I'm, I'm not gonna go through, but uh, the other point, I suppose, the only thing that I will mention is the use of the semicolon at the end of each statement. In At the beginning, when, when JavaScript came out back in the late uh, 90s, and for a number of years, prior to ES, uh, prior to ES6, then you as a developer, you had to use the semicolon at the, uh, at the end of each statement, not at the end of each line now, because some statements may be multi-line. And the purpose of the semicolon, similar to Java really, is it tells the uh, the interpreter, because we, we don't compile JavaScript, as you know, unlike Java, it tells the runtime interpreter where a statement finishes. And once the runtime interpreter sees the semicolon, it knows now that it can execute that particular statement uh, before it moves on to the next statement. But since ES6, uh, the situation has become much more relaxed about the use of the semicolon. And you'll see probably in my code that sometimes I use it and sometimes I don't. So in a sense, I'm being inconsistent. But I suppose it's really the reason that, that is happening to me is because I would have been writing JavaScript code before the, uh, the use of it became more... Uh, relaxed, but even if you don't use semicolon at the end of each statement, what happens is when you use the Babel transpiler to convert that into ES5 JavaScript code, 
it will automatically insert the semicolons for you anyway. And that's called uh, automatic semicolon insertion, which I'm mentioning here. So uh, the Babel transpiler tool takes care of that. So 99% of cases, you really don't need to use a semicolon. There are a few small edge cases where even though you're writing modern JavaScript code, yeah, you would need to use a semicolon in order to help the Babel transpiler understand your code. Now, you won't be writing such complex JavaScript code uh, where that will arise, but um, that is the situation anyway. So technically, it is a statement terminator, uh, but now Babel takes care of inserting it into your code for you. And that's the let and const, which I stumbled my way through there. So with let, you're saying that the variable can be reassigned or it's it's kind of mutable. Um, with const, you are stating that it cannot be reassigned. When you declare a variable with const, you must initialize it on declaration. You can't, for example, I could not do, uh, I couldn't do this. By the way, that's how you, sorry now. Just bear with me for a second. Uh, the double forward slash is how you add a comment. But essentially what I'm doing here now is I'm declaring pi using const, but I'm not initializing it. And even if I take out this line here, get rid of that error, I'm still going to get an error, I think, from the runtime. Yeah, it's telling me that you you, you haven't initialized in the const variable that you've declared. So you must initialize it on declaration, and you cannot subsequently reassign a different value to it. Uh, both any type of variable that you declare in the language, it has what's called block scope, which is essentially the same as the scope that you get with a language like Java. A block in JavaScript is any piece of logic that is enclosed in curly braces. Now, we haven't looked at JavaScript logic, but for example, when you declare a function, any variable, uh, the, the body of a function is a block because we enclose it in curly braces. Any variable that you clear inside that block is only visible within that function. A for loop is another example of a construct where the body is enclosed in curly braces. And so any variable you declare inside the body of a for loop, it's only very visible inside that, uh, that block. So either way, block scoping is what applies to JavaScript today. In the original language, it had two types of scoping, which we needn't get into, but that was the case. So uh, the language has primitives, and that's all we've been talking about so far. Outside of that, you just have one construct available to you called the object construct. Uh, and that is the only construct that you can use to declare or describe any kind of complex state or data that you want to represent. But it turns out that that single object construct is sufficient to uh, describe the structure of any kind of data structure that you might have. So the object construct is what we're calling the fundamental uh, structure of a state representation. Uh, and it's a, it's a way of composing uh, it's a unit of composition of data or state. 
from a syntax point of view, uh, it turns out we use the curly brace to uh, declare an object structure, but the curly braces in this case are not linked to scoping in any way. So what, what is an object? An object I'm saying is a set of key value pairs, and this is the syntax that you use. So you begin the object with the curly brace. The key has to be unique within the object. The colon separates the key from its value. So this combination of here of key and value is what we refer to as a property. And you separate properties with comma. And so you have the next key and its value. That's property number two. And then on, on and on it goes. So that's the literal syntax for declaring um, object structures. So they're key value pairs. A key value pair is termed a property. The key is the identifier within the object, and it has to be unique. Uh, the values I'm saying can be uh, a primitive, or it could be another object. So you have this notion of nesting objects within objects, and that's when things start to get uh, interesting and when you start representing more complex structures. Uh, JavaScript also has arrays, but we'll see later on that arrays are nothing other than objects with special properties. So for now, anyway, the value of a particular property within an object could be a primitive or it could be a, a nested object itself. And indeed in that nested object, some of its properties could also be uh, inner objects. So we have any level of nesting that we wish. Uh, just to complicate the matter, it turns out as well that the value associated with a key within an object could actually be a function, could be a piece of logic. Uh, but we'll kind of conveniently ignore that for now. Here's a very simple declaration of an object. I've decided to use const in this case, uh, but th that's okay. So in this particular object, it has two properties, one called uh, first name and the other one called last name. And it happens to have strings as their values, but the, the values could be of mixed type. They don't all have to be of the same type. Once you declare an object, typically what you want to be able to do is manipulate it, i.e. access particular properties within an object, change properties within an object, add new properties, remove properties. How do we do all of these things? So first of all, um, in terms of the notation of manipulating properties, there are two notations. Uh, there's the dot notation. So if we have this expression here where me refers to that object that you saw on the previous slide, the expression me dot first name, that's going to evaluate to the string Dermot. So this is an expression. This is the key, one of the keys within this object. So if I did a console.log of that expression, it would output the string Dermot. An alternative notation that we can use is the subscript notation. And in many cases, it's an either or. You pick whichever notation you prefer using. In some cases, you have to use one of the notations. Uh, you can't use the other. And that typically is where you have to use the subscript notation and you can't use the dot notation. We may come across an example of that in a while. But the subscript notation looks like this. Or using your subscript, uh, your subscript um, uh, symbols, if you like, the square brackets. Uh, and within the square brackets, you specify one of the keys of your object, but you have to represent it as a string. If you leave out the quotes here, uh, you're going to get potentially an error. And I don't think it cares whether it's single quotes or double quotes. So that expression, uh, in our case, that expression is going to evaluate to the same thing that this expression here evaluated to. So whether you use dot notation or subscript notation, it's a matter of choice and style. It's the same notation that you use if you want to change a property. So here we're using the dot notation, but it's a, on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. So essentially, we're changing the value associated with this key within the me object. I'm changing it to Jeremiah. Here's how you would use the subscript notation when you want to change a particular value associated with the property. And uh, if you know your Irish, 
is the Gaelic for O'Connor. So dot notation, subscript notation. Here I'm saying the subscript notation supports uh, a variable reference. So in here, you can actually have a variable name. You do not enclose the variable name in quotes. You just leave the variable uh, unquoted. And all that happens at runtime is, and hopefully the variable name, the variable that you're referring to is assigned a string value. If it's not, then you're in trouble. But if it is assigned a string value and that string value matches one of the keys of your object, then uh, it'll all work out fine. So you can use variables here using the subscript notation. You cannot use variables with the dot notation. So me dot a variable name here just won't work. Uh, the way it'll interpret that is it will take the actual, the name of the variable. So let's cause let's say it's foo one, and it'll go looking for a key within the me object called foo one. Even though you've declared a variable earlier on called foo one, and let's supposing you assigned it the string first name, uh, it's still not going to work. It's not going to evaluate it in the same way that it would have evaluated it in the subscript uh, approach. And so yeah, you can see the example here. I've got const key equals that. And then I do a console.log of me subscript key. Now, here's one of the uh, issues that caught out a lot of people initially when this const was introduced into the language because it was introduced uh, much more recently in probably ES6, I would say. It turns out that when you declare a an object using the const variable, then you can actually change the inner parts of that object. In other words, it's mutatable. You cannot assign a different object to the const variable but you can change the structure of the object that you did assign to the const variable. And now I know that's a tiny bit confusing and everybody gets caught out by it initially, uh, but really once you've seen one or two examples, then it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so to reinforce, I'm saying const cannot be reassigned, but its internal value uh, can be changed or mutated. Let's refer to one of our samples. So we're told to look at the 02 sample. Uh, just bear with me one second now because I'm slightly running out of juice in my computer here. Back to our little case study. So if we now go back to here and we disable that script that we're no longer interested in, we'll enable this one and we'll open up the 02 script. And it's the same boring joke every year. Uh, here's an object that contains some information most of which is not true about me. Like I'm not, uh, I am not 21 years old and I don't have a bank balance of 20.2 million. But all that aside, okay, here's just a standard little object structure and I've used const. I could have used let here. It wouldn't make any difference to the runtime behavior. But if you look at the rest of my script, I never reassign me to I never reassign the me variable. And so because I don't reassign it anywhere, then it's more informative to the other readers to use const here rather than let. But in terms of objects, okay, there's my object. And I'm just demonstrating uh, the dot notation and subscript notation. So const log me dot name should output Damon O'Connor and me subscript address should output um should I put one main street? And given that we've made a change to our HTML and saved it, if I go back to my browser, uh, I'm now getting uh, this line here. Uh, do you remember I can't lose that one main street? 
Moving on. Okay, here's my example of using variables. So I've got a variable called BB, which is a very badly named variable. Sorry about that. So it's assigned the string bank balance though, which is a valid key within my structure. And so when I do a console.log of me of me subscript BB, then that line corresponds to what you see there. Uh, balance equals. And again, to reinforce, don't make the mistake of doing putting quotes around this. Because now it's looking for a key within the me object, uh, a key called BB, and clearly doesn't have it. Now, uh, if I save this and console.log, what's going to happen? Undefined comes back to bite us. The second case where undefined arises, the first case is when you declare a variable and you don't initialize it, then the default value that the runtime gives to that variable is the value undefined. The second occasion when undefined arises is if you try and access a property that does not exist within an object. And that's what we were trying to do there. We were trying to access the BB property, didn't exist. And so the expression me subscript BB uh, evaluates to undefined. Uh, I suppose in, technically in this case, it is an error, uh, but it's it's silent. We don't get a runtime error. You know, we're not getting something appearing in red here on the console, which is typically what the console will uh, do when it hits an error in your code that actually causes your code to crash. Uh, but what we say is on, it's kind of, it's silent here. Uh, but if we uh, if we assigned the me subscript BB to a variable, you know, if I if I did if I took this here, and I go, let's do it down here. I go let who equals that. That's still not going to throw an error, but if I now try to access foo, if I treat foo as an object and I try and access properties within it, dot whatever, then that is going to uh, cause my program to crash. And you see that happening in a while. And that is something that you will come across at some stage. So while it's silent here and you think everything is okay, it's when you start trying to use foo and treat it as having a normal value other than undefined, uh, that's when uh, problems arise and the runtime typically anyway will crash and throw an exception. But for now, uh, we're going to avoid that. So that's the basics of object manipulation. Uh, objects are dynamic, we're told here, which means that properties can be uh, properties can be inserted and removed at runtime dynamically. So we're told to look at sample zero three. And so I have the me object again here and here. I'm going me dot. Uh, employer, but I don't have a property called employer up here. So this, the effect of this expression is to essentially add a new property to the object and assign that property, whatever value I'm giving it. So in this case, I'm giving it uh, width. So that's, it's not an error. Uh, it's just going to add the, uh, add the property to the object. Hence the object is now, it's dynamic, you know, it can expand and contract as you wish. So when I do this console.log, everything should be as normal. Uh, 
uh, deleting a property uh, syntactically, it's a little bit clumsy, but uh, this is how you do it. Uh, and so if I delete the age property and I now come along and I try and do a console.log involving me.age, then my question to you is, because I'm going to see if I can get you to say something, uh, what is this console.log going to output? Oh, I've given it away, sorry. <laughs> it's going to output undefined, badly prepared by me. Uh, okay, that's just going to output undefined. Now, I'm not going to run all of these uh, individually. I'm just going to talk through the code, but you know how to run them at this stage. You go back to your index.html, enable the, the relevant script, and for cleanliness, disable all the other ones and work your way through them. So let's keep on going with the slides. Uh, the next thing we're told is that objects can be nested, and this is where it starts getting interested. Uh, interesting, as in uh, you can have values uh, that themselves are objects within an object. Uh, a property value, maybe, oh yeah, maybe an object structure itself, and we're told to look at 041. So in this case, uh, here is an example of a nested object. And you just follow the syntax, really. And here's another example of a nested object within uh, my me object. And in terms of trying to access any of the properties of the nested object, you just follow the uh, the, the um, the core rules of using either the dot notation and the subscript notation. And so we have some examples here. Uh, so here I'm going me dot name subscript first. So you'd expect that to uh, output the string Dermid. You can mix and match your dot notation and your subscript notation. So if I wanted to use subscript or sorry, dot notation everywhere, then I just go me dot name dot first and I get the same results over here. I'm using subscript notation in both cases. Another typical beginner's error is would be to uh, put a dot in there. Okay, so syntactically that's incorrect. Uh, you're gonna get a runtime error. Um, let's prove that to ourselves. Looks like I don't have zero four. Which one am I on? Zero four. Which one am I looking at? Zero four one, yes. Looks like I don't have zero four one there. So I'll just change this one. Now, where are we going? Did an uncomment it? Have I got something wrong? Didn't uncomment it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm trying to be too clever here now. It's still didn't uncomment it. No. Okay, so the error there is uh, it's just a syntax error and it's being triggered from, let's close off some of these now because I don't need as many of them open. Mm 
Yeah. Something you can do with uh, VS Code, I can show you some other time, is um, you can get VS Code to automatically save your file. If you've made changes, it, you can set a timer on it. So I think in my case, I've got it to automatically save after five seconds. So I don't have to do it manually every time myself, but uh, it's not a life changer. But so now my script is uh, running cleanly. And if I did want to use the dot notation at the end here, I can just go. Can I give me the way I've done it? Bank. Um... Oh, yeah, I can do this instead. Yeah, still happy with that. Right, uh, so that's the, the kind of 101 of nested objects. The last point I'm making at the bottom here is that a property value can be a variable reference. Well, we've seen that before, but the variable could actually itself be an object. So if we look at 0, 4, 2, So here I've got this small little object here, and in the me object, I've got a key called name, and the value associated with the key name is a variable uh, which happens to have the same name. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm sure you get what I'm getting at here now, but uh, you can do it like this. And everything will still work fine. So when you're trying to uh, navigate into the inner part of name one here, starting off with me, as you see me doing down here, uh, me dot name dot first, that expression is still going to work fine, even though it's sort of moving from the me object onto the name object within that expression that I've highlighted there at the bottom. Okay, um, so it all works as you would expect it to work, I guess. The point I'm making here, and again, this is something that was introduced more recently into the language. When you've got a situation where the key, uh, the key name and the variable assigned to that key also has the same name, then as a shorthand, you can just write it like this. In other words, you can just reduce that to that and the Babel transpiler will change this line it'll convert it back to the full version as in that it'll do that automatically for you so again it's it's just a shorthand and you see me using it sometimes um, and so now you know uh, that it it actually expands it so it's just making life easier for the developer really, if that occasion arises. Uh, outside of that, uh, what we're really illustrating here is this idea where the value associated with the key, the value may actually be an, an object somewhere else within your code base as it is here. But you, you still use the dot notation and our subscript notation to navigate through from the outer object, which is me, right into the inner object, which in this case is name. Uh, you use the, the same notation. So you, you never know, you can't tell. If you didn't see the objects, you cannot tell from here. You can't tell that there is a nested object actually within the me structure there. Nor should it be important.
there are occasions when you have an object. This kind of arise maybe when you pass an object into a function and the function wants to just extract the keys from that object for whatever reason. So the way you do it is to use this expression here. Object here with a capital O is referring to a global object that's provided by the runtime. And that global object has a method associated with it. Uh, so that's what we're that's how you evaluate this here. I'm I'm invoking the key method associated with the object global object. And what you pass that method is you pass it an ordinary data object, if we might call it that. The, the objects we've been looking at so far could be described as data objects. And what the key method does is it extracts the keys within this object data object that you've passed with. And it, still, it copies, makes a copy of those keys into an array. And so it returns an array of strings where the strings are the names of the keys within the data object that you pass through. And you can do whatever you want then with that array. Similarly, you may just want to extract the values from a data object. So this is the expression that you use. You invoke the values method, pass it the object. And again, the values method returns an array where each entry in the array is one of the values associated with one of the properties of your data object. Uh, the in operator is also a new feature. So if we had an expression like this, typically we, we might use an expression like this in an if statement. So if you can imagine this expression is the conditional statement associated with an if statement then uh, this is going to evaluate, this always evaluates to a Boolean true or false. Uh, and what we are trying to determine here is, does this object contain within it a key called that? You have to enclose this in, uh, in quotes. And so that's either a, a true or false result. Uh, we're told to refer to 042, which is the one we were looking at, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, so you can see me doing it here, and then I do a console.log of that. So what does that console.log generate? to my script, my HTML. And because I don't have it, I'm just going to change this one. And I think this is probably it here. Yeah, and they are the keys of the me object as you as you saw. Let's see. Uh, yeah, well, you can you can enable these lines yourself. I'll I'll disable them just for now. Uh, but and if I just enable, let's say this one here. So this console.log, because what I'm passing to it is a uh, essentially a, a kind of a boolean expression, uh, and it's asking. It's trying to determine is address one of the keys within the me object. Did I have an address property? No. Uh, sorry, I do, yeah. So that should evaluate to true. And let's see, did it do that? Uh, yeah, there's my true there. And just for the sake of it. And the second one is this one. Should evaluate the false. 
Yeah. Now, there is another way, and again, it's kind of a reflection of the fact that I, I've been doing some JavaScript coding before some of these new features came in, but there is another way of determining whether a property exists within an object or not. And it is as follows. You can say, um, supposing I change this here to, me subscript address so that is another way of determining whether a property exists within an object or not. Now, I've told you, like, anytime you try and access a non-existent property of an object, then that expression evaluates to undefined. So if address was not a property in the me object, then me subscript address would evaluate to undefined. And I'm comparing it here. This is the triple equals is the way of doing comparison in JavaScript. I'm comparing it to the undefined value. So in my case, this entire expression here should evaluate to false because address does exist. Uh, so if I prove that to you, I'm just going to take out this line because I'm not interested in this anymore. And save it, assuming I don't have any syntax errors. Yeah, so it's coming back with false and equally. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I could have used the not equals there as well. If I use not equals, then now it should evaluate to true uh, because me dot address is not equal to undefined. <laughs> I'm confusing myself. Why is that coming up to false? Oh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry that sorry that expression that overall expression me subscript address not equal to undefined. That overall expression. Why is it saying is it it's false? What have I got wrong there? No, it does. It's because it's saying it's true. I think. Oh, did it oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Save by the boat. That's fine. Um, so that's just the in operator. I, I don't tend to use it, to be honest with you. I tend to use the other the other approach there, the uh, comparing it to undefined. Again, that's just a sort of reflection of old school um, approach. But uh, there you go. Moving on anyway, uh, oh yeah. Um, the reason we can actually use the subscript notation at all is because internally keys are stored as strings um, in memory. Now, this is something that's nice to know, but of no real value. So even though if I go back to my code, You know, if I just take the me object here, these keys, even though I'm not putting quotes around them, they are actually stored as strings internally within memory. Uh, and that is why the subscript notation is supported by the language. That's just a by the way, but uh, it won't uh, benefit you in any way really to know that, but it's just the case. Now, uh, this is what I was mentioning earlier on, but I, I kind of skimmed over it because uh, it, it is quite important actually to be aware of it because this is what I say every year to students. What I say is every one of you will get this error at some stage uh, as you walk your way through this course. Uh, and <laughs> I haven't been wrong so far. Uh, it's one of the most common errors that arises and it always catches people out. And there, 
they always have difficulty trying to work out well, what is the error actually telling me and what I try to achieve is to explain to you why the error is being thrown now what's causing it then depends on the specifics of your particular application but so to explain the error the error kind of reads some sort of variation of this cannot read property of undefined so if we take a step back for us, supposing we have, um, suppose we try to access an invalid property of an object, and I've shown you examples of this already. So generically, supposing some object is a variable that is pointing at an object structure, and I'm trying to access the property, bad property within that object, and I'm telling you that this object here does not have a property called bad property, then this entire expression is going to evaluate to undefined. We know that uh, already. But as I've said, it's uh, the runtime is silent about that. It doesn't throw an error because you try to access uh, an invalid property of an object. It won't throw an error at that stage. So I'm saying it's not fatal. Uh, okay, your code may not be doing what you want it to do, but at least it won't crash. However, down here I'm saying, if we try to treat the undefined value as if it was an object and then try and index into it, then you're gonna get problems. So to demonstrate, if I have now the expression some object dot bad property, and we now know that, that this part of the expression so far is going to evaluate to undefined, but I'm now trying to index into the undefined value, I, I think that this expression evaluates to something sensible, uh, some sort of sensible object, and I'm trying to access a property within that object. Now this entire expression, because this part here evaluates to undefined, this entire expression is now gonna cause your program to crash. And the error that you're gonna get is this error up here. And let's read the error again. I cannot read the property undefined you're trying to read the property called property of the undefined value. <laughs> uh, this is an actual screenshot of an example of the error coming out. So while this is silent, even though get, getting it, uh, even though the, the property doesn't exist, if you try and go further then and treat the undefined value as if it was a normal object and try and index into it, then you're going to get the, the error that we're talking about. Uh, try to give one or two examples of it, zero, four, three. And really, uh, no matter how often I do this uh, and how often I show the examples of it arising, uh, people still get cut out by it, and so that's okay. But here's some forced examples of this error happening. So again, I've got uh, I've got the name object, I've got the me object, and I'm doing a console.log of me dot finance dot deposit. So if I look up at me dot finance finance that inner object doesn't have a property called deposit. So this console.log is going to what's going to happen with that console.log question for you? Is it going to crash? Or is it going to output something to the screen, to the to the uh, dev tools? Undefined to the screen. Uh, it's just going to output undefined. It's not going to crash as in any code that happens after the like the line that I've highlighted. It's just going to execute. Next thing I do is another console log, and I do me that finance that deposit dot bank. We now know though that me dot finance that deposit. That's going to evaluate to the value undefined and the value undefined is not an object. And so when you try and index into that thing, now it's going to crash. And just to prove it, let's go back to our index.html and I'm gonna stick in another console.log just to Uh, 
I move that up. So this should output undefined. This should output hello. This should cause the program to crash. I got undefined, I got hello, and there's my crash. And again, I don't know, there's something popping up on my screen now that's hiding the error, but. Uh, so the error you can read there yourself is in cannot, cannot find property of undefined, uh, which is what I've just been saying in the property. What it's telling you here is the, the actual property. It's trying to read the bank property of undefined. And that is the property that I was trying to access, I think, isn't it? Um, yeah, they, that's the property that I was uh, trying to access. And, you know, if I, when I say it crashes, if I move the hello down below that line, and sorry, if I move it down below that line. Now this console.log is not going to execute at all because my uh, my script has crashed before it gets to it. Yeah, so I don't see the hello popping up at all. So try and uh, lock that into your brain somewhere. And there are there are a number of variations of the actual message that you get back, uh, but it's always talking about trying to access property of undefined, and then the rest depends on the context in which it arises. But um, the solution then, though, it depends on the specifics of uh, whatever you're programming. It, it nearly always arises when you, in your case anyway, when you get an object from your server, let's say. It sends an object to your browser, and then you've got JavaScript code in the browser that's navigating that object, uh, and you haven't studied the structure of that object uh, in enough detail, and you're treat, you, you think there are properties or inner properties within nested objects that don't actually exist, uh, and you get the error being thrown by your JavaScript code. That is typically where it will arise in your case, but as much as I can say it, uh, you're still going to be thrown by it when it does arise. Are we on time? Uh, oh my God. Right. Uh, I've got as far than I thought I'd get actually. So we'll, we'll stop it there and uh, I guess we pick up the story the next day. Now, just in terms of lab, if you can bear with me for one minute, in terms of the labs, got a little bit further than I thought to be honest with you but if you are interested and you know if you're not familiar or if uh, it's a long while since you played around with JavaScript then you you should be able to walk your way through the majority of this first lab here the second lab deals with functions now if you're very familiar with JavaScript by all means have a go at that lab as well but uh, I'm not re requiring you to do that but certainly you I've covered enough today to allow you to work your way to uh, this lab, <clears throat> excuse me, and it'll also get you into uh, using uh, VS Code, which will be useful if you haven't used it already. All right, I'm uh, I'm going to stop there. I certainly, can take any questions if you have any uh, before we close the show. But if not, that's fine. No, okay, that's fine. I will, uh, so there's a lab on Thursday and um, it will be online, but if you do want to come in to DO5 to the room, I'll I'll turn up there and uh, you can just say hello if nothing else, but you can certainly work away through the labs uh, remotely if you wish and just get in touch with us through Slack and we'll deal with any problems that you have. All right. 
I'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye for now. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thanks, Steve.